<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I think everyone who's coming has come, so we can uh, we can get started. So. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. It's great to see so many faces. Um, the topic of this session is how to thrive in a changing market. Now, uh, the first question is, how is the world of books and, um, and writers changing? I've got two great examples. The first is that the li- last typewriter manufacturer in the world closed operation last year. They were uh, producing less than 1,000 units a year. And, uh, and so, officially, typewriters are the relics of another age. Uh, the second example of the ways in which the world of books and writers are changing is that after printing the hardback reference guide for 244 years, Encyclopedia Britannica stopped publishing its 32-volume print edition. It's now fully digitized and accessed by 100 million students around the world. Now, the president of Encyclopedia Britannica, Jorge Coz, wrote the following message to his customers online. By concentrating our efforts on our digital properties, we can continuously update our content and further expand the number of topics and the depth with which they are treated without the space constraints of the print set. Well, when he puts it that way, how can we object? Up-to-date data on a wider range of topics, a more dynamic and and responsive data set? Sounds brilliant. Unless, of course, you make your living selling encyclopedias (laughs) door-to-door. Then you're appalled. You rage against the injustice of it all, the decline of culture, the devaluation of knowledge. But that's not really true, is it? Culture isn't in decline. It's on the rise if you look in the right places. Knowledge is hardly devalued. It's accessible to more human beings on Earth now than in any time in our history. So I'm going to argue that there are quite a high number of us in this room who are traveling encyclopedia salesmen. That in our present incarnation, we're all hurtling towards obsolescence, that we're naturally reluctant to adapt to a changing environment, and that we view these changes as inherently negative. Now, I've encountered the specter of obsolescence many times in my career. I was an independent bookseller for seven years, and I watched as our customers were lured away by the deep discounters, and I thought, If you want to buy your books at Shoppers Drug Mart, go right ahead. I don't want your business anyway, which wasn't a very enlightened response. But I decided to get out of the book selling business, and I became a book buyer for a national chain that operates the airport bookstores across the country. And then 9-11 happened, and airport travel declined precipitously, and we saw all of our customers go away. And then I thought, okay, what's next? I became a sales rep for uh, Penguin, and uh, I traveled around my little territory, visiting all the independents, selling them the big Penguin list, and watched as the independents struggled to compete with Indigo and Amazon. And a lot of you will know that um, the independent booksellers in this country, their market share has shrunk considerably over the years, and so I knew the days of field sales reps on the road selling to independents were, were severely limited. And so I moved to the editorial department at Penguin, and I thought, surely to God we can't do without editors. <laughs> and then self-publishing exploded, <laughs> and with it came the ascendancy of the ebook. So now critics everywhere are predicting the death of traditional publishing, and I'm thinking to myself, really? <laughs> Uh, Why did I choose this industry? Well, of course, because I love books. But sometimes I feel as though I'm running away from a cliff, the the edge of a cliff, and the the ground is falling falling away beneath my heels. Now, as I gaze out at this very good-looking crowd, I see a few sympathetic head nods. Maybe some of you have felt obsolete in your positions, too. Maybe some of you worked for Blockbuster, Uh, And we all know that Blockbuster is pretty much done because we don't rent videos anymore. We watch movies on demand. Maybe some of you worked for HMV, which is now almost done because nobody buys CDs anymore. We get all of our music digitally. Maybe some of you work for Canada Post, which posted an annual loss of $253 million in 2011, the first time the agencies failed to make a profit in 16 years because we don't send letters anymore and we opt to get our bills electronically. Obsolescence is everywhere. We're just seeing an acceleration of obsolescence because we're getting better and better at technological innovation. If you're a techie, a member of the Digerati, rejoice. 
the geeks have inherited the earth. <laughs> Me, I'm a traveling encyclopedia salesman, and I find navigating this industry quite difficult at times. But ultimately, I can't imagine myself working in any other industry, and so I stay, and I try to adapt. Now, before we all start crying in our coffee cups at the hopelessness of it all, let's take a closer look at the state of Canadian publishing. Are the big five publishers recording record losses too? Is the, is the death of traditional publishing in Canada upon us? Actually, no, and not even close. In 2011, the Canadian Publishers Council reported that Canadian publishers' revenue was $469 million. That's only down 5% from 2010. A 5% dip is hardly a catastrophe, and most Canadian publishers reduced their retail prices in 2011 due to a strong dollar, and that had a detrimental effect on revenue. But a positive effect at the cash register because Canadians didn't stop buying books. They spent almost a billion dollars on them last year. So, why all the doom and gloom? The real volatility in the book market is due to the rise of ebook sales. That rise took off in 2010 when Canadian publishers valued the ebook market at around $4 million. In 2011, sales doubled to more than $10 million. And as ebook sales rise, we do see print sales come down. So currently, there's a lot of debate about how ebook sales are cannibalizing print sales and how that will play out in the coming years. Some say that right now, customers are opting for the ebook over the expensive hardcover edition. And while others are pointing to mass market paperback sales being eroded by ebooks, what we know for sure is that genre fiction, romance, science fiction, fantasy, and crime novels are seeing a surge in digital sales and a slump in print. But the good news is that in almost every major book market in the world, the sales increase in digital it almost entirely makes up for that slump in print sales. The market might be flat, but it certainly isn't tanking. The Canadian publishers who've succumbed to bankruptcy in the past few years haven't done so because ebooks destroyed their business model. Mismanagement maybe, but ebooks no. Ebooks are an opportunity, not a threat to traditional publishing. Uh, however, the rise of ebooks is really bad news for independents. They've yet to find a way to fully participate in the ebook boom. It's easier and cheaper for readers to order ebooks from online retailers in Indigo, like Indigo and Amazon. It's even easier and cheaper to order print books from Indigo and Amazon. Now, Canadian independents like the Sentry Box here in Calgary continue to thrive because they reach out and draw readers in. They don't wait for them to walk through the door. But Canada does continue to lose its once vibrant independent booksellers to competition, and they're very vocal about it, and that's why uh, there's so much doom and gloom in the marketplace. Um, so um, Canadians, I think, are going to different outlets to buy their books, certainly not better ones with more knowledgeable staff or better lighting, just different ones. They're going to online retailers that sell other stuff too, like bikes and diapers and garden tools. So how is Amazon doing, you ask? Well, last month they announced a 19% hike in worldwide media sales, which includes books, DVDs, music, and digital content. The Kindle Fire is its best-selling product, and the company reported that 16 of its top, 10, top 100 best-selling titles overall were published via Kindle Direct Publishing. Those are the self-published titles that retail for about 99 cents. Profit at Amazon, though, sank 35%, and that's because Amazon is, invest is reinvesting in itself, furiously building distribution centers around the world to support their online sales. And perhaps even more importantly, they're selling the Kindle Fire below cost to ensure its widespread adoption, according to Forbes magazine. So their best-selling product is the Kindle, and they're losing money on every unit. So at this point, I'd like to talk about our American cousins. American publishers are having a really tough time. The U.S. print market has plunged 16% in the first quarter of 2012. The adult fiction market was hardest hit, dropping 26%. The nonfiction market dropped 16%, but the juvenile market increased, largely due to Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games trilogy. That drop in the print market is driven by the continued migration to digital, and the loss of retailers like Borders in the U.S. But why is their print market so low compared to Canada's? It's because their e-book market is so strong. 
U.S. publishers' sales of e-books more than doubled in 2011, meaning that the digital book is, the now, is now the dominant single format within the trade sector's adult fiction category, representing 30% of all adult fiction book sales. Now, according to Shelf Awareness, which is an online news pay, uh, newsletter for American booksellers, Australia, India, and the UK and the US lead the world in ebook adoption rates, with more than 20% of respondents saying they purchased ebooks in the last six months. French readers and Japanese readers are the least likely to have purchased an ebook. In most countries surveyed, men were more likely to women than women to buy an ebook, although the US was the exception to the rule. There, more women than men buy ebooks. Purchase rates are the highest in the 25 to 34 age group. According to The Bookseller, a UK trade publication, nearly a third of people in the UK already own an e-reader. A third of those people admit to downloading books illegally. Who knew the Brits were so sketchy? <laughs> so more readers are going digital every day, and in spite of the decline of the print market in America, people are reading more and more and buying more books. In their annual report last August, the Association of American Publishers reported that overall revenues and the number of books sold in all formats, including digital, were up sizably in the three years since 2008. Digital consumers in America read far more books on average, about 24 a year, than print consumers. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to how many books a Canadian reads in a year? It's not good. 17. Uh, I couldn't find a statistic for the e-books, but that, so that's print books. But it really troubles me um, for, for two reasons. If we don't know how many e-books the average Canadian buys in a year, how on earth can we manage our business? But more importantly, how is it possible that Americans read more books than we do? That's appalling. I, for one, am hideously embarrassed. What we're really seeing then, when we synthesize all of this information about the global book market that you've been very patiently sitting through, isn't the end of traditional publishing per se, but a sea change in how readers source their content. So what are we to do, authors and publishers, to thrive in this changing market? How do we succeed in these turbulent times? I think it's simple. We do what Encyclopedia Britannica did, and we follow the reader. Now, there's an amazing blog called Findings. In it, you'll find conversations about trends in reading from some really amazing writers. They ask the questions, how do you read now? And how, how do you think that's going to change? How do you leave your mark on what you've read? So all these conversations are about social reading and digital media. So the first author that I want to talk about is Stephen Johnson. He's a brilliant, best-selling nonfiction writer. And he thinks that nonfiction texts will evolve in the way that Wikipedia entries evolve. That open-endedness will mean that a reader is capable of participating, adding links and commenting. He says that the locked-down nature of a print novel where the text is finished will become less and less orthodox. Laura Miller and Maude Newton, a co-founder of Salon and a freelance writer, think that novels don't really lend themselves to an interactive experience. The joy in a novel, they say, is one of surrender, which isn't to say that you can't be an active reader reading a novel. Laura Miller says, a poor reader cannot have a great reading experience with a great author. But both Laura and Maude agree that nonfiction lends itself much more to an interactive experience that plays better on an iPad rather than an e-reader. Ryan Chapman, the online marketing manager for FSG, reads in many formats, print on the subway, on a laptop at home, Kobo for manuscripts from work. It's worth noting that all the authors on findings read from a combination of print and digital. Ryan thinks reading behaviors will hew much closer to certain genres, e-readers for romance and thriller and sci-fi fans, iPads for nonfiction readers, he thinks that interoperability between devices and ebooks is the way to foster greater innovation. Richard Nash, the publisher of Soft Skull, thinks that by adding links, video, and audio to books, that we're really doing them a grave disservice, essentially undermining a book's greatest strength, which he says is their ability to maintain user attention over an extended period of time by requiring the user to use his or her imagination to interpolate the video and the audio to project what those five senses would be experiencing. 
Clive Thompson, a contributing writer for Wired and the New York Times magazine, thinks that print books aren't going anywhere. He cites predictions of the paperless office in the 80s when everyone thought that computers would replace paper. That didn't work, of course, because computers made attractive documents easy to produce. And if you make something easier to do, more people are going to do it. He thinks that mass market books will, enti- will definitely go entirely digital and that weird, small, interesting books will go the print-on-demand direction. And he thinks that print-on-demand might explode. We might all have print-on-demand machines in our homes at one point, making Amazon's brilliant distribution of physical books obsolete. He says, people who say print is going away aren't looking at what is happening to the, te- to the technology of printing books. Clay Shirky, writer, teacher, and consultant on the social and economic effects of internet technology, says that publishing is simply not evolving at all. Publishing is over. It's not a job. It's a button. When you press publish, it's done. He says we need editing. He says we need fact-checking. And for long-form text, we need designers. But that's it. He says we'll all realize that when more of us hit the print button when reading the New York Times online than actually buy the physical copy. Now, these are all fascinating ideas about where reading behaviors are headed from the brightest minds in the business. And I think that the most interesting idea is that we'll use different devices for different genres. Uh, in the question and answer period after this, I think we should all we should take a survey of how everyone's reading now, what their reading behaviors are, whether it's print or digital or a combination of the two, and how you feel that reading is going to evolve. Um, for now, though, here's how traditional publishers are following the reader, like Encyclopedia Britannica. They're doing four things. The first one, they're acquiring reader data. Number two, they're co- they're combing the blogosphere looking for really great blogs and then buying up those rights and printing them. Uh, Number three, they're keeping an eye on self-published authors. And number four, they're marketing directly to moms. So let me explain some of those things. Uh, Acquiring reader data. In the U.S., two-thirds of publishers plan to increase their investment in acquiring reader data. They believe that to be successful, the publisher of the future must have a database of individual customers it can have a relationship with and even contact directly. Three-quarters of all U.S. publishers already have customer information. James L. McQuivy, the analyst behind this research, said that publishers can see into the digital future a bridge that can potentially be built between publisher and customer. Knowing who readers are, what they like, and what they want next requires building a base of demographic information. Number two, combing the blogosphere. The number of best-selling books based on blogs is exploding. Publishers are following online readers to the best blogs on the web and offering these bloggers huge deals. So, for example, Neil Pazrisha, a Torontonian, began writing a blog in 2008 called 1,000 Awesome Things. It won a Webby Award for Best Blog and got a massive number of hits. In 2009, he signed with a literary agent, and it was published in April 2010 and immediately became a bestseller. The book of Even More Awesome released a year later, and both have reached the number one spot in many international markets. He sold millions of copies worldwide, and all the publisher had to do was follow those online readers. Third, keep an eye on those self-published authors. Now, we all know the story of E.L. James. She wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. It was originally a piece of fan fiction focused on Stephanie Meyer's Twilight series. The book was released in both ebook and print-on-demand paperback in June 2011 by the Writer's Coffee Shop. Word of mouth made it a bestseller, and American news networks reported on it as an example of viral marketing and the rise in popularity of erotica, attributing its success to the discreet nature of e-reading devices. Vintage Books bought the license to publish in North America, and now the trilogy tops the bestseller list here, too. Now there's speculation surrounding the identity of author Sylvain Renard, a writer who just received a sweet seven-figure deal from Penguin U.S.'s Berkeley input, imprint. Berkeley will publish Reynard's best-selling erotic novels, Gabriel's Inferno and Gabriel's Rapture, which were first released as e-books. Like E.L. James' Fifty Shades of Grey, the books were adapted from serialized Twilight fan fiction. 
Now, self-publishing isn't a recent phenomenon at all. Publishers have been acquiring the rights to self-published books for decades. The South Beach Diet, The One Minute Manager, The Artist's Way, What to Expect When You're Expecting, Aragon, The Celestine Prophecy, The Joy of Cooking, The Elements of Style, and The Shack were all self-published before a large trade publisher bought rights and distributed the books to a global market. The fourth thing that publishers are doing is marketing books in the places where moms go online, because moms are huge book buyers. Media Bistro, another media blog that I read regularly, reported on a Facebook study this April. Moms are more active on Facebook and more receptive to marketing messages posted there than women who don't have kids. According to the study, moms are 75% more likely than other women to trust information that companies post on social media, like publishers, and 45% more more likely to base purchasing decisions on peers' recommendations. 50% of Facebook moms have discussed books on social media, as opposed to 46% of other women. 19% of Facebook moms made a purchase because of social media recommendations. Only 14% of other women did. So what we know from that is that Facebook is a great place to market books, parenting books, kids' books, and women's fiction, anything that women read, more so than other types of books. So publishers are focusing a lot of their marketing efforts on these mom sites. Pinterest is another brilliant mom site. It's a rapidly growing social networking site upon which users post images and links to a virtual pin board and share visual thoughts with other readers. In January 2012, Comscore reported the site had 11.7 million unique users, making it the fastest site in history to break through the 10 million million unique visitor mark. Most of the site's users are female, with 90% of the Facebook likes being made by women. Publishers and writers promote their books, and users can search for book recommendations in the film, music, and book section of the site. Online marketing for the book industry has reached fever pitch. Canadian publishers promote on Facebook pages, Facebook social ads, book blogger sites, and Twitter, and actively train their marketers in search engine optimization and social media optimization. And I'll just define my terms here for you. Search engine optimization is the process by which a site or its content is enhanced in order to maximize its searchability or its ranking in search results. Tagging, the process of associating particular keywords with website content, is a fundamental component of search engine optimization and is particularly valuable when editors are writing jacket copy that will be uploaded to online retailers. Social media optimization aims to increase the linkability of a website. RSS feeds or rich site summary feeds, blogging, podcasting, video sharing, social bookmarking, social networking, collaborative ranking, and wikis are tools to create links that lead back to publisher, author, and book websites. Now here's how self-published authors are following the reader. They're writing genre novels. Bestseller lists are dominated by commercial fiction, movie tie-ins, and franchise authors. George R.R. Martin, Stieg Larsson, Suzanne Collins, Stephen King, Diana Gabaldon, Jody Picot, John Grisham. All of these authors write genre fiction, and it dominates the lists. Self-published authors follow their lead. They write what readers want to read. The second thing that uh, self-published authors do and do well, they get endorsements from other writers. Other writers can offer blurbs that attract their readership to your book. It's a savvy marketing tool and one that traditional publishers have been using for decades. Giveaways. If you give your book away for free on sites like Amazon or price it at 99 cents, it rapidly ascends the bestseller chart. The higher it climbs, the more readers will notice it and the more likely they are to give it a try. But be warned, if you give your book away for free or charge only 99 cents, you'll look self-published and less professional. David Simon, author and screenwriter of Homicide, Life on the Streets, The Wire, and Treme, goes further and says that anything that says content should be free makes it hard for all writers everywhere. He goes on to say, a free internet is wonderful It's wonderful for democratized, unresearched commentary, and it works well as a library of sorts for content that no longer needs a defense of its copyright. But journalism, literature, film, music, these endeavors need people operating at the highest professional level, and they need to make a living doing what they do. Copyright matters 
content costs. So what else can self-published authors do to find and follow the reader? They need to pay more attention to distribution and learn about market share. A lot of self-published authors think that they can publish with Amazon and reach the widest readership possible. If you think that, you haven't done your research. If you only publish your book on Amazon, if you signed an exclusive deal with them, you're not reaching 75% of your market. If you only publish your book with Apple, if you signed an exclusive deal with them, you're not reaching 80% of your market. Google, you're not reaching 97% of your market. The best place to publish your ebook is on Kobo with Indigo. If you do that, you'll reach over 50% of your potential market because Kobo sells over 50% of all the ebooks in Canada. So these are just a few ways uh, how authors and publishers are adapting to the changing book market, finding their readers. They're closely watching reading trends and behavior and trying to anticipate demand. But are they doing a good enough job? We'll see. So and now I want to open it up and, um, and ask people um, how their reading, how their reading behavior has changed. Anybody have any? Mm -hmm. um, I did a reading at a school, and as payment for an interview and uh, sitting with the students, I got a gift card for Indigo and Chapters. Mm -hmm. I bought a Kobo. Mm -hmm. And since then, I have not bought another paper book yet. Really? How long have you had your Kobo? Six months. OK. Have you been in a physical bricks and mortar bookstore since then? Yes. Oh, you yes. have. Yeah, I visited fairly often. Um, I've picked up and often gotten pretty close to the till, but then usually I just go on the Kobo store. So when you're in the bookstore, are you kind of making lists of the books that you want? Yeah. And then you're. I'm looking at covers and I'm looking at titles. And... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I spent the last four years in the U.S. living in Connecticut and. Uh, uh, I came really close a couple times to buying a, a Nook from Barnes & Noble, mm -hmm. um, but every time I looked at the Nook, it just didn't seem to have, because I wanted it for more than just reading, Yeah. so I've been looking at an iPad recently, mm -hmm. um, mainly so I can read comics and books and use it for other stuff, but yeah. it's, I'm pretty close to buying an iPad so that I can use the Kobo reader on the iPad. Yeah, the app, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, or I can use the Amazon reader. Or right. Yeah. Versatility, so that you, you can actually shop around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have an iPad, and in the last, I guess, year, year and a half, I've probably bought about 20 business books, mm -hmm. but I can't read a novel on an iPad. It doesn't have that intimate mm -hmm. point where you can just curl up and turn the pages. I still need to have that. For so you story. are, um, uh, you're the, the genre, for lack of a better term here, is determining the, um, the way in which I you read. Interesting. Okay, yeah. Uh, I read about 200 books a year. I just got a couple for Christmas because one of my books came out as an e-book, so yeah. I wanted to be able to read it. And uh, when I, I still love print books more, but I have started reading quite a few e-books. And I find what I'm doing is every Saturday we, we make a trip to the bookstore and I, I get you know my favorite author. Mm -hmm. But I'm more likely to try a new author in an e-book form. And also, I'm less likely to, you know, if I run out of books to read, um, before I would go and reread an old favorite, mm -hmm. now I'm more likely to buy an ebook instead because I can do that right away from my house. When you are um, buying an ebook from a date, from an author you haven't encountered before, is the author published traditionally or is the, um, the lower price point of a self published novel ever lured you in? Um, I, I don't think I bought more than. Uh, couple self-published ones. Mm -hmm. uh, one because I, I knew the author and another because of the recommendation on Goodreads. Mm -hmm. But mostly I've been buying from my publisher, Karina Press's site. Mm -hmm. We have a, an author loop that I sort of kind of gotten to know these authors online mm -hmm. and so I'll get their books in trouble. Okay, okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I've been reading a little year on something that was mostly in Kindle. Kindle, yep. Uh, there are some advantages, especially for me, that English is a second language, but it's a built in text. Oh, right, of course. And, uh, he's, he's reading on a Kindle, it's got a built in, um, is it a, like a translation? No, no. What? Yes. Oh, you, could, you can access uh, like, books in different languages on Kindle. No, no, if you read it like arcane English, 
in the autocon in Doyle. Yes. I don't understand a lot of the words, so I just go and they tell you there is an English and English dictionary. Oh, okay, I see. What you're if it's a Robert J. Soyle, I don't need a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And, and yeah. now I'm thinking of converting to audiobooks. Okay. Because of commuting right now. Yeah, yeah. I just started reading ebooks for the first time this year. I was going traffic and I was like, okay. And what, as soon as I realized I could download the free Kindle app to my to my laptop, yeah. I was like, okay. And then I actually initially I scooped a whole bunch of free books because I had no idea whether I was going to like these mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And at first it was yeah, different, like you mm -hmm. said, you, know, you haven't got the, the paper book. But after a while, I really like it. Yeah. But I had a look at my sister's Kindle. And I was like, yeah, it's tiny. Mm -hmm. Like. That's too small. I don't, do you know what I mean? Like, it didn't really grab me. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'd adapt if I had one. Mm -hmm. But the idea that I could actually have inputs without having to have a separate reader was, was really, I didn't want another piece of equipment that I had to take with me. Yes, yes. So, that was a big breakthrough. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a, I'm also a teacher, mm -hmm. and so um, I sometimes prefer books in general, just in print books. Mm -hmm. We call them pee books. <laughs> <laughs> I like the smell a little. Yeah. Uh, so that's my preference, although just with the nature of work, we have to do now professional development on smart boards, iPads, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. it's changing a lot in the school. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been reading off an iPad for about a year. It wouldn't have been something that was given to me as a gift from my father. Um, and I fall in love with it. But the other thing I'm doing is I'm still going into chapters and in Indigo, and I'm checking prices, and then I'll check you know, the, the e-books to see which is cheaper. Yeah. And if it's cheaper, the electronic version, I'll typically buy that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is a lot of self-published uh, books that are on Amazon, you read through the reviews by by other readers, mm -hmm. and they're really important. And I've picked up all kinds of books that by unknown authors mm -hmm. they've got the five star rating and you've got people who are reviewing and, and saying yeah this is really good or stay away from this yeah yeah oh that's great yeah um uh, i've been re like uh, i used to have like an old palm three and i would and uh, like you could hold like about uh, five or six novels <laughs> right right and uh, what i found is i'm sort of i'm sort of like uh, with the ebooks, I'm sort of in the place where I was with the iTunes back when I was waiting for the DRM to go away, so mm -hmm. I didn't have to buy like an iPod. Mm -hmm. or, and uh, right now, the only things that I buy are like uh, DRM free stuff. Right yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly I'm just waiting for the publishers to move towards uh, DRM free <laughs> because uh, yeah. like the e reader I have now is isn't uh, like a Kobo or anything yeah. else. It's, and the market's still a little bit yeah. right now. DRM is digital rights management, and publishers kind of lock it down because they don't want uh, a lot of piracy. Yeah, at the back. Yeah, I, uh, I read both uh, physical and, and e-books. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm doing research, particularly, I never use an e-book because e-books are so terrible at replicating photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. you, know, you, you really have a hard time figuring out what you see. Yeah. I also prefer to read a hardcover over anything. Mm -hmm. The one thing I will say, uh, I use ebooks mostly when I'm traveling, but, but you know, I've never had a paper book freeze on. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, the, the browsability of ebooks is severely limited. There's no, you know, it's, if you, uh, you want to go back and check something, it's, it's hard to find. Um, and um, it's really hard to annotate an ebook. Yeah, back there. Now that I've moved away from the city and I'm living in a rural area, what I find interesting is, you know, you, there's a huge market of people living in remote or rural areas that don't have access to technology that's going to allow us to, to read any great amount of books. Mm. So we're still tending to go towards the print. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And, and can I say one quick thing about yeah. libraries that I've noticed as well? And when I go to the library now, I find it quite interesting um, just how it's changed over time. Mm -hmm. Now, quite often, instead of a child bringing a bunch of books, yep. they might have just a big stack of DVD Disney movies or whatever. Yeah. And so that's changed a lot. And even how they process them, they have now 
you just drop off your book, it checks it in, it goes along the conveyor belt, they drop into the slots, and then they're all sorted. It's like wow. the technology to totally automated. Them. Yeah. But also when I search books now, yeah. it used to be just always the book came up, but now I'm seeing more all the e-books. Mm-hmm. Um, Rob Sawyer has more e-readers than any person I know, and so I'm really interested to hear what uh, what uh, Rob's reading on now and his experience with all these various platforms. Well, thank you for asking, Adrian. <laughs> you can come right up here, Rob, if you want a microphone. Uh, all right, I will for a second, do. since you are my editor, and I do everything my editor asks. Exactly. <laughs> Most of the reading, excuse my voice, I was up partying way too late with my editor last night. Indeed. Um, most of the reading I do is actually on my iPhone, and mostly with the Kobo app on my iPhone. And uh, somebody over here mentioned the small screen being an impediment. For me, what has, uh, and like many an e-reader, person who uses e-reading devices, I found that my amount of reading that I do has gone up. And I've been reading e-books for over 10 years now as my principal form of e-reading. I was an early adopter. I was reading on the Palm platform very early on. Uh, and if you go to YouTube and put in Robert J. Sawyer eBooks, there's a video survey of all the e-reading devices I've owned over the years, going back to a Rocket eBook at the beginning, all this kind of stuff. Um, but for me, the number one thing that's increased my consumption is the fact that I have this with me all the time. I own a Kobo. I own a Kindle. I own a Kobo Vox. I own all kinds of devices that I don't always have with me all the time, and this I do. Um, so it's the fact that it's with me, and if I have five minutes to wait in line, or even <clears throat> I'm on the toilet or something, I'm actually reading when I wouldn't otherwise have been reading, and my consumption has gone way up. Um, the thing that bugs me the most, uh, and even my sainted publisher, Penguin, is guilty of this, is crappy formatting in eBooks. It drives me nuts to see books that have been brought to the market, and it's certainly very true in self-published books, but also a lot of big publishers digitize their backlist by doing optical character recognition on print copies because they didn't have the electronic files for older books. And the number of errors that get introduced are appalling. It drives me nuts. And Kindle has this idea that on narrow screens, one should nonetheless still be reading fully justified text and it looks awful. And without some various hacks, there are no ways to turn it off on Kindle, but Kobo lets you turn it off for every book, which is why Canadian patriotism set aside, I'm much more of a Kobo app user than a Kindle app user. Kindle gives you more font choices, more layout, sorry, Kobo gives you more font choices, more layout choices, uh, more justification, margin choices, all of that's up to you on Kobo. And Kindle says on the iPhone app, this is the typeface, this is the justification, live with it, and that drives me nuts. Um, so I read a lot of ebooks, and I'm glad that I have lots of ebook readers, but since this is about the future of publishing, and um, uh, since it's you know, cards on the table, the biggest difference from an author's point of view between e publishing mm -hmm. and self, uh, sorry, e uh, giving your print rights to a traditional publisher who will control your e rights and self publishing is the uh, rate of compensation for the author. Amazon has attracted a lot of people, including a lot of very good authors, by offering 70% of gross sales as the royalty. And Penguin Worldwide, not my sainted editor Adrian, but worldwide, Penguin offers 25% of net uh, as the compensation. So if your book is $2.99 on Kindle, you get about 2 bucks if you're self-published, and you get 25% of 70% of $2.99 if you're traditionally published. And that's going to be the battleground between otherwise uh, joyously um, collaborative <laughs> authors and publishers. Uh, I used to be president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and the problem with the of America is in the United States, there's so many separate authors groups, and they do a very poor job of coordinating. In Canada, everybody's represented by the Writers' Union of Canada, and they've articulated the position, as you well know, mm -hmm. that the royalties should be split evenly, 50% of gross Sorry, 50% of net should go to the author, 50% to the publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, the big issue right now is everybody clearly understands that there are cost savings in electronic distribution and what portion of that should be retained by the publisher who is no longer bearing those principal costs. So I love reading as an e-book writer. I love knowing, mm -hmm. as, a, as a customer, I love 
knowing that I have tons of e-readers, but all of us who are traditionally published, that's the number one issue for us, is how we're going to be able to enjoy the fruits of all those things that Adrian mm -hmm. outlined, curated, carefully produced mm -hmm. culture that takes a lot of time and effort to produce. I think that um, the negotiations between agents representing traditionally published authors and publishers, I think the pressure, um, the vocal, um, how vocal authors have become is really going to affect, um, redress that imbalance of compensation. It's going to take a while, but I think, I think it's going to happen. I think it is too. I mean, otherwise I would have jumped ship, obviously. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, yeah. many of my colleagues have, have mm -hmm. said, screw this. And I said, no, there's still way more benefit yeah. in having a penguin behind me than in not having a penguin yeah. behind me, including this question of whether or not uh, anybody but me. Now, I'm at a point where, okay, I've been a published writer for 32 years in the science fiction field. I'm at a point where I have a track record and awards and all that kind of stuff. But for a beginning writer, the fact that somebody other than me and my mother has said this is a good book does mean something to the reading audience. Yeah, the curated list of books has yeah. still got value. Authors with platforms have um, a, lot, um, a lot more leverage when it comes to that, um, that negotiating power. And, quite rightly, you can say, I could go on my own. You yes. Know? You've got a solid readership, and they would follow you wherever you went, regardless of your publisher. So, yeah, publishers have to really redress that imbalance. Yes. Um, you talked about thriving in a changing market, yep. and are you suggesting, or maybe there's some more brainstorming to be done, is the only change in the market the difference between print and read, reading, or is there other changes that you haven't to date so far mentioned? Yeah, the other, the other huge change is the explosion of self-publishing, and, and what Rob was saying. Uh, authors, self-published authors, choosing that path in order to retain more control and more profit from the um, from the fruits of their labors. Um, traditional publishing has a lot of prestige associated with it. Um, we've got great distribution of print books, but in terms of the of the digital world, where um, we're not as um, quick and responsive, and um, we're not as willing to share the profits um, in the traditional model as opposed to the self-publishing one. So the self-publishing uh, explosion is a, huge, um, is a huge blow to our industry. One of the things that did change, though, if I may for a second, mm -hmm. is that you, uh, book retailing was different than most other kinds of retailing. Most people go into a hardware store knowing what they want to buy. Most people go into a bookstore traditionally without knowing what they intend to purchase. They go to look for ideas. And with the death of um, independent bookstores and somebody like Adrian, when she worked at Nicholas Hoare being there to hand sell you a book, people now, when they go to Amazon, they go because they saw somebody interviewed on Jon Stewart and they want the book immediately and they're not going through a browsing process or they're going because Goodreads or some other social media site that they rely on has recommended this. And then they go directly. They click on the Goodreads link. So the idea, uh, the, the big theme of the Canadian Publishing Summit this year was discoverability in an age of abundance. It used to be, and in fact in genre publishing in the States, it always was, the single biggest thing a publisher did for you was get you to the one spot where you could be discovered, which was the bookstore shelf. And... Now they say, for most of the genre published in the States, that's all they do. They don't do book tours. They don't do advertising. So you now we got you into the science fiction or mystery or whatever section at Barnes & Noble. We've done our job. But when people are bypassing the browsing experience and instead directly going, you know, what uh, was it Clay Shirky who said publishing is now a button? Mm -hmm. So is book buying. It's no longer a process. You don't go browsing around, oh, look at this, try a ch chapter here, does that cover catch my eye? You know what book you want, you click a link, and you're done. And how does somebody who is not in that process become discoverable is a gigantic change to what's gone on in how you build your market. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think you, you might, you, I know you're addressing this issue, but there's this huge demographic, this, this uh, retired age demographic. Mm -hmm that I participate in by living in Panama for a lot of the year. In Panama, we have humidity. We, we were sharing all our books that we could, mm -hmm. and then we just all got e-readers, and so we just, mm -hmm. we're all doing that. And I think you'll find that all these retired people are on their cruises and everything like this, 
that's what they want. They don't, and you know you have to pay so much for luggage these days. Oh yeah. So nobody wants this weight and the. No. You're right. Um, I talked about um, airport book retailing dying after 9-11. The death throw is actually occurring right now. Um, travelers don't want to add <laughs> any additional weight to their baggage. So I was in the airport on Tuesday, and uh, I'm walking around with my Kindle in my hand. I'm browsing. I'm deciding which titles I want, and then I buy them online. I download them, and those physical books stay on the shelves in the airports. Airport retailing is just about done. Retired people are in a hurry to read everything they want, always wanted to read before they die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing... <laughs> they just, I mean, we read three books a week, but, you know, we just read three books. The other thing about retired readers is their eyes are not as good as they used to be. And ebook readers let every book have a large print edition, mm -hmm. optionally, if mm -hmm. that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And I'm astonished about how little marketing there is in that area. Because for me, the number one thing that drove me to ebooks is I don't have terrible vision. And although this is a small screen, I've got big type on this screen. And I find the reading experience way more comfortable than most of the print books I buy, especially mass market paperbacks where it's dead to me because the type is too small. Yes. Robert, you mentioned formatting um, for, you know, off just starting or, or you know, getting into publishing, self-publishing, and e-book publishing. What would you recommend in terms of formatting? You're, you're saying generally there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of crappy formatting. I mean, by crappy formatting, I mean things like no spaces between sentences, paragraphs that don't have indentations or other indications that you have a change of paragraph, uh, typographical errors, terrible hyphenation or no hyphenation, right justification with no hyphenation looks awful. Um, all of the things that go into designing a proper printed page should be adhered to. And just throwing a Word document through a publication wizard does not necessarily result in something that's going to display adequately on screen. I have seen many a book on Kindle that is essentially unreadable on Kindle, which means that the publisher did a conversion process, did that Clay Shirky push a button thing, and never looked at the output. And believe me, when we go, Adrian and I will be bringing out my next book in April, mm -hmm. I will be looking at uh, typesetting page proofs, everybody will be we will be all our, there will of course be typos, there always are. We'll be mortified by every single one because it slipped through a really sophisticated process that's designed to catch those errors. And all of that is simply dispensed with in most people going to the push a button and be published thing. Um, my own recommendation to you is if you don't know how to do it, hire somebody for a one-time fee. Ryan McFadden, who is here at the convention, does this. Uh, he's the person who does it for um, cheesing. He's their contracted guy who does all their conversions. Doesn't take an ongoing royalty, one time fee, and gets beautiful looking ebooks for them. Uh, my friend Marcel Gagne does uh, formatting for Kobo, uh, one time fee, and the books get done correctly. The mistake is for somebody to say, I will format your book and upload it for Kindle, and I'll take a big hunk of the money in perpetuity for a cost that really is only a couple of hours worth of uh, sophisticated labor. So if they're formatting, I'm guessing they're using an application to do that? or Almost everybody uses Calibre. It's just a question about how good you are at using it. Although um, my friend Marcel wrote a new front end for Kobo's front uh, self-publishing business, uses a front end that was written in Waterloo, Ontario by a programmer there. But uh, everybody else uses Calibre or some front end on top of Calibre. And Calibre is free. Um, but it's got lots and lots of options, and if you haven't bothered to look at how it works, it won't. And I don't mean the big publishers necessarily use Caliber, but almost every self-published author does. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.